Jane, thank you so much for your time and for uh, for giving uh, making yourself available to Broad Agenda. We really appreciate it. No, I'm delighted to be here. Can I start by asking you about women and democracy? Uh, before we get into the, um, or drill down on democracy, women and representation, political representation, is an issue that's been discussed a great deal in Australia. Um, I want to come straight to the issue of why it matters. Does equal representation of men and women matter in our parliaments and matter in our cabinets? Yeah, I think there are two reasons why it matters. I mean, one is, one is simply that uh, if we live in a society which is ordered by gender, which Australia is, Britain is, I mean, any society we know in the world in terms of the organisation of care work, the organisation of employment, the kind of the culture. Gender is a kind of crucial feature that orders our lives. If you live in that kind of society, men and women broadly are going to have different kinds of preoccupations, concerns, perspectives that need to be represented in politics. And the idea that all of those could be represented either by an all-male legislature, which we've had in the past, or what we get at the moment, which is maybe legislatures where uh, one in four politicians are women. That's a real problem. So that's the first thing is just the kind of like, just ensuring that people's different concerns get a voice and get a representation in the political decisions. But I think there's also, and this is where a kind of 50-50 issue becomes really powerful. There's also the question of, I mean, democracy is supposed to be recognizing us all as political equals. And what does it say about the nature of us as citizens if it seems incapable <laughs> of delivering a system in which men and women alike are equally engaged in making the political decisions that affect our lives. So, I, I mean, I think, you know, the, the evidence that um, research has come up with as to exactly what difference does it make, whether you have 10% women, 20% women, 30% women, even, and there are countries where it's 40 and 50% women, what difference does it make to policy? There's, there's a lot of evidence about the differences that it does make, but it's not kind of overwhelming, right? And so sceptics sometimes say, well, you know, exactly what, does it really matter? It seems to me that even if you could find absolutely no evidence of it making a difference, there is a kind of basic question about citizenship and what equal citizenship means. And it doesn't just mean we have an equal right to vote. It's got surely to mean that we have equal participation in our political systems. So I think there are both those arguments. There's the interest argument, which is, you know, it's open, of course, to uh, some kind of empirical testing about exactly what difference it makes when women are there. Do, do you think it does make a difference, though, on, on exactly that? Well, I mean, I think, do, do, do yeah. women represent women's issues better? Yeah, I think, I think on, on, on the issues that we think of as women's issues, it, it unquestionably makes a difference. So if you're thinking about questions like the increased emphasis on uh, issues of uh, equal pay, sex harassment, uh, childcare issues, you know, the kinds of issues that we conventionally think of as women's issues. Of course, they should be everyone's issues, but, you know, th those kinds of issues, there is no question that when you have an increased presence of women in decision-making bodies, it become, these become much more items on the agenda. Can it become a bit of a burden though for women who are elected into office because they are there representing their electorates and perhaps myriad issues of concern and yet they're expected to also carry the banner for women and women's issues? Yes, and I think, I think lots of women in politics do find that uh, quite troubling. Um, generally, uh, the pressure on that eases when you get more women in politics. Um, I think the, the pattern in which women politicians say, I am here as a representative of this party or that party and the fact that I'm a woman is completely irrelevant, that tends to happen at a time when you have fewer women in politics. But when you move to larger proportions of women in politics, um, I, think, I think women find it much easier to say, I have a particular knowledge and expertise in this field which hasn't been addressed in our discussion so far and I'm going to draw on that as well as all the other concerns that my constituents have. Half my constituents are women after all. How much gender diversity is necessary in, in our um, 
parliaments is a little bit okay. We talk about 30% being a critical mass, which to me sounds bizarre because it's not 50-50, but a little bit okay. In Australia, we have never reached uh, beyond 30% in our House of Representatives. Um, in both houses at the moment, federally, we're around 32%, but we struggle to get past that. So, you know, do, but there's also a lethargy about even talking about this anymore. People keep saying to me, Virginia, things are changing, it's getting better. But is a little bit okay or are we kidding ourselves? Well, <laughs> I certainly think a little bit isn't okay. I think the whole kind of question about, there is very much, a, as you say, there's a, there's a tendency to think that we're on the right trajectory. It's moving in the right direction. We can lament about how slow it is on certain occasions, but there's a kind of, people have a kind of confidence that it's moving in the right direction. Well, in most cases, when it is moving in the, in the right direction, it's because there has been very extensive mobilization um, often including forms of affirmative action, gender quotas and so on, in order to even arrive at that stage. So none of this happens naturally. So we've, we've just recently been celebrating uh, the uh, uh, centenary of the 1918 Representation of the People Act in the UK, which is the first legislation that gave, not even all, but some women over the age of 30, the, the right to vote. And you look, and then a few months after that legislation, there was further legislation that gave women the right to stand for parliament. Um, and uh, so you get the first uh, woman MP elected in uh, 1919. Um, and then if you look at the figures, it is so extraordinary. You have this, the, the figures which are 2%, 3%, 2.5%, 3.5%, 8%, 2.5%, and it goes on like this for 70 years. 70 years, right? Um, and the, the, really the point at which you get a kind of serious increase in the proportion of women in Parliament. The political parties have seriously adopted any kind of affirmative action. Um, so there is no natural transition here. The, uh, the changes occur because people have made them occur. So that's the first thing. There is no natural transition. So, so you would say that quotas are absolutely necessary? I think that they are, that they have been hugely important in um, arriving at the situation where, you know, we now have basically one in four <laughs> women in politics. I mean, it seems astonishing that you would need quotas even to achieve that. I've, I'm a strong supporter of, uh, of gender quotas. Um, because I think that there is no natural progression without them. But it, that's not to say that in every country in the world they have been necessary. I mean, not all countries that have very high proportions of women in politics um, have needed gender quotas. There are other things that can produce the same effect. But generally, uh, I think the evidence is pretty clear from around the world that uh, the countries that where there is significant, a significant increase are countries where some form of affirmative action has been uh, has been employed. I'd like to ask you a little bit about multiculturalism and women. Um, Australia is a very multicultural mm. place. It's certainly not reflected in our parliaments or in our, um, our governing systems. Um, when you look at the makeup of yes. who's in power yeah. and, and who has leadership. Nevertheless, um, multiculturalism is, is, uh, is complex when we talk about gender, and I know you've spoken about this at great length and certainly done a great deal of work in this area. Can you explain um, w what is the tension between women, culture and multiculturalism? I think there's, there's a tension in contexts where people take multiculturalism to mean in a multicultural society uh, we must ensure that each of the constituent cultures uh, is able to sustain itself and retain its kind of, you know, its, its, its core cultural uh, practices and beliefs. If you think of multiculturalism as like that, which I have to say very few people do, but if you think of it as like that, then the, potentially what you're doing is adopting a policy in which uh, what are defined as the core practices of a culture often turn out to be very disadvantageous to women. So there's, there's a risk if you, I mean, if you set up in any situation, if you were to say, you know, what are the core kind of practices of Australian culture, whatever Australian culture is, you know, that 
you know, if you looked at, at that kind of a history of Australian culture, you would find so many practices which are disadvantageous to women. So if you had a politics that was about sustaining cultural practices, that's potentially a problem. So, the, so that's where there's a kind of tension between versions of multiculturalism and, and the interests of women or feminism. I don't think that there's... I mean, generally, I think multiculturalism understood as we are multicultural societies and what that means is that we have to recognise that diversity and not simply impose one culture on all the other cultures. That kind of multiculturalism absolutely ought to be compatible with feminism. Well, what is the role, though, of feminism and, and feminists um, when confronted with what is referred to as cultural practices or traditional practices or customs that um, some feminists might find abhorrent, um, be it on a killing or FGM or even um, full body covering, etc.? Well, the, the, mo the most useful thing is to work with those organisations of women uh, within the various cultural groups who are campaigning against practices that they find problematic um, for women. So, um, I mean, that's, I mean, you, you'd, you'd never find a kind of context in which there isn't some kind of self-organisation of women, which is already challenging these things. Actually, myself, I find it, I think it's problematic to call these cultural practices, because when you use the term cultural practice, you give the impression that these are the norm within particular cultural groups where forced marriage is not a cultural practice in the sense of being a norm that any, everyone in a particular cultural group would say, oh yes, what we do around here is forced marriage. Um, you might have a norm of arranged marriage, uh, which then in particular situations ends up as uh, young people being forced into marriage, but you never get kind of a, a culture which said, our practice is to force people into marriage. That's, that's not the reality. So I think, I think one has to be quite careful about using the notion of cultural practices. I'm just concerned, though, that there's a certain amount of cultural relativism that goes on here when, when we have a, a feminist argument about what, what's OK and what's not, and at, at what point can I intervene, should I intervene, or is it not my business? Well, questions about intervention are, are I think, pragmatic policy questions. There's always a kind of issue, if you're devising policy, about to what extent one does something like like introduce a legislative ban, to what extent one works through education, uh, to what extent one works through activist groups within different communities. So there are, there are very practical policy questions about intervention. So um, those, are, those are the kind of the, I think, the key important questions about intervention. Um, in terms of whether it is legitimate to have intervention against something which puts women at a disadvantage or which causes harm. Uh, again, there will be issues about whether you are imposing a particular notion of disadvantage that is your notion rather than something that would be more widely shared. So you do have to think about these issues. But certainly, once, once, once one can establish that something is to the disadvantage of women or that it is harming women or that it is a form of oppression of women, uh, then, then you get into the discussion about what's the best way to intervene. One woman's version of oppression may be very yeah, different from another's, absolutely. though. Absolutely, yes. And, and I think one has to be really careful about uh, jumping in with a kind of uh, a preconceived idea. You know, I mean, I think some of the politics in contemporary Europe, which is around um, you know, banning women from uh, wearing uh, full body covering in, in the street, I mean... Uh, to me, it's, it's just astonishingly illiberal. Um, uh, and it's done in the name of, we are protecting you from your oppression. So when f certain forms of very restrictive clothing are prescribed for women, whereas men don't have to wear the same kind of restrictive clothing, it seems to me there is clearly an issue there um, that you know, sort of can be described as a form of oppression or disadvantage. But, but you know... You, you have to actually also recognise that people are agents and have choices and make choices for themselves. So I th I, it's a really kind of, uh, it's a much more complex uh, field than is uh, commonly recognised, I think, in some of the kind of the uh, uh, sort of media or popular representations. I want to move on to um, uh, sexism yes. and let's go straight to Donald Trump and Trumpism. 
Uh, and speaking of democracies, uh, why do you think women or even a single woman would vote for a man who has been so overtly sexist and made a, a, a great virtue out of being um, a powerful man yes. who controls women? Well, what, what seems to be the case is that when women are asked why, they say, I don't like it. I don't like that kind of aspect of the way he behaves. Um, but the other things that he represents are more important to me. So the way I read it is not so much that you have women endorsing sexism, right? But you, what you have is the other sort of issue and problem that arises is women saying, those aspects about gender equality, sexism, all of that, they're important, but they're not the most important things, which I th that's, what I, that's the way I read it, is of, is of women saying, those aren't the most important things. You don't hear women saying, yes, I like the way Trump talks about women. You don't hear that. But what you hear is them saying, Yes, I don't like that aspect of him, but he speaks for me in other ways. Isn't there also possibly an element uh, of some women um, uh, finding a bit of comfort in the old-fashioned sexism that he that he represents? That it's something they think is is, is somehow natural. That that men will dominate, and that men such as him like beautiful women and expect women to be uh, present in a certain way, and that that's kind of okay because that's the way the world is. Well, I think I'm more optimistic than you on that one. You know, I I think that, um, and I do think that that my my reading of it is more confirmed by the interviews that you hear with people, which is I, I do think there's been a there's been quite a cultural shift in relation to ideas about women being simply perceived, women perceiving themselves is the better way to put it, simply as objects to be desired or simply uh, bodies to hang clothes on. I think there's been a real shift in women's perceptions. There hasn't been quite the same shift in male perceptions. But I do think that, um, I, I do think that the kind of the issue that comes up is not women saying, I like this way of thinking about us. It's much more about, I don't like this way of thinking about it, but I don't regard it as the biggest issue. And that, that's what one is engaging with, it seems to me, is how big an issue do people think it is? I won't dwell on this too much, but I find that particularly interesting yeah. because as, as someone who's worked in um, television media for, for yeah. several decades, um, I've witnessed, and colleagues of mine would agree with me on this, we've, we've witnessed a... Um, a change in the representation of women in media, in mainstream media, yes. Yes. in a way that is quite negative, where the representation has become even worse, yes. as in yes. the yes. sexism, the yes. flaunting. You get away, I've worked in TV news most of my life and in current affairs, you get away with uh, representing women now on television that you wouldn't have when I first started back in the 80s. You just wouldn't have. You wouldn't, you, you wouldn't have been allowed to show women in, in that particular light, and now it's standard. So what's yes, going on I, there? I, I mean, I'm, I'm interested that you say that with your kind of, uh, you know, obviously much greater knowledge and experience of the kind of the way in which it's shifted over time, because that's exactly my perception as well. And I think we're in an era where the, um, in a sense, the, uh, the sexualization of women and the representation of women through appearances has intensified. I mean, again, it's a, it's a really strong case of there not being a natural trajectory in the direction that we might think of as gender equality. So that uh, I think the, the beauty norms on young women are much more restrictive than they were when I was a young woman. Um, I think the kind of the representations of uh, of women in the media, as you say, are much more kind of constrained and sexualized. Um, I think the, the pressures on young girls are in many ways much tougher than they used to be. So this seems to be a, an area where, you know, if anything, one is going backwards rather than forwards. And I think that's, that's then reflected in uh, the, um, you know, this has been an area of very extensive recent mobilisation around questions of sexual harassment, the whole Me Too campaign and so on. It, let's focus on that a little bit, the Me Too campaign, and in fact, and other uh, similar uh, online campaigns, Everyday Sexism, yes. um, the Pussy Hat Project, etc. What do you see is going on here? What's your take on whether or not it's really being effective? 
I think it's extraordinarily effective for a period in um, getting people talking about noticing. I mean, sexism is something that you, you in, a say, in a sense, you learn to notice it. You live with it for many, many years, and then actually you start realizing it, and you see it everywhere. And I, I mean, I, I, it certainly has been my experience, and I think it's the experience of, of, uh, of many people. So I think it's extraordinarily effective in having that kind of that, that moment in which people s start taking note of what they had perhaps just thought of as just part and parcel of life and something you put up with. What I don't know is what the lasting impact is. And, uh, and there I'm a bit more pessimistic about just how lasting it is. But you know, one, one hopes it, it will have a lasting impact. Pessimistic because why? Because it, it is a simple sort of activism. It doesn't. It doesn't cost a great deal. I mean, it personally, cost a great yes. deal. Maybe, maybe that's it. That um, it seems to me, it, it's. I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying that it that it is going to be short lived. I'm just saying I'm not confident that it won't be. But that um, yes, I think it is partly that it doesn't uh, it doesn't lock you into any kind of particular organisational setting in which you are continuing the conversation with other people, except via, of course, the, the contributions through the social media. There's a kind of fashion, a fashion element to this, of sort of things become, you know, the activity of the moment, and then something else becomes the activity of the next moment. I, but I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not proclaiming any kind of, you know, you know confident, with any confidence about what I think about this. But I think that's the... That's the kind of the question. It undoubtedly has a kind of huge impact at a certain moment. What kind of lasting impact it has, you know, we, we have to kind of wait and see, I guess. Just lastly, as a, as a feminist scholar with an enormous body of work behind you and, um, you know, an extraordinary um, legacy and reputation, I'm interested to hear whether or not you sense a backlash brewing uh, in terms of gender equality and gender relations? Yes, I think that a lot of what people uh, describe as the uh, populist movements and populist politics of which support for Trump is, is one element, I think is partly fueled by a perception that, uh, that the political establishment has um, uh, adopted uh, feminism, uh, adopted anti-racism, adopted multiculturalism, adopted gay and lesbian rights as kind of its kind of, you know, some of its core principles. It's a very odd idea because I see very little evidence that the political establishment has done this, but I think, I think there is a, I think this is part of what fuels populism, is, is a sense that these have become the new norm and that they disrupt and disturb people's sense of how their life uh, ought to be or used to be. So I think, I think undoubtedly that's, I think I see, I see populism as containing within it elements for backlash against a kind of, in my view, a sort of a misperception of the uh, success <laughs> of feminist ideas or the success of the trajectory towards gender equality. Um, but that, yes, that, that you could describe that as, as, as kind of part of a backlash. Where do you see, what, what do you see gender equality looking like by the year 2030, for example? <laughs> well, I think that there will continue to be progress in terms of political representation, in terms of moving towards uh, greater, greater parity between the sexes in um, positions of um, in political influence and, and so on. I think, I think there will continue to be movements there because people are, are mobilising for that, right? Uh, I'm much less confident about what's going to happen about the representations of masculinity and femininity because it seems to me, you know, so, so what, you know, the, the, the ways in which I think women are more sexualised now than they were 20 years ago or the, the ways in which the kind of the beauty norms are more oppressive on women than they might have been 20 years ago. So I, I, I'm much less confident about the ways in which those shifts in terms of parity of representation are also going to have a transformative effect in terms of just the ways in which we understand women and men. So um, confident in one area, but not... Uh, 
throughout. <laughs> I'll take that as a half glass yes. full cup. Yes, yes, yeah. But, uh, you know, whatever happens depends on people, on, on what we do, really. I mean, nothing happens naturally. It's, it's all a matter of kind of engaging in, you know, the necessary struggles to achieve it. I think we have our work cut out for us. And thank you so much. It well, has been such a delight to speak with you. And thank you for coming along and um, saying hello to Broad Agenda. Thank you.